All right, so we're going to start talking about different methods besides participant observation and interviews with the comparative method. Um, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's just research um, that involves systematic comparison of several societies or cultures. So instead of focusing on uncovering everything you can find out about one culture, you are looking at the same process or same institution across multiple cultures. Um, so Lewis Henry Morgan gathered kinship data from around the world doing a comparative method. Um, and that's a very good historic example of where it kind of began, but it's still relevant in modern anthropology today. And so there's a huge database called the Human Relations Area Files, um, and this is a project by Yale. And this is just a ton of comparative data. This is a lot of information um, about cultures from all over the world. And so you can look by culture or you can look by behavior or social institution or process. So you could look at religious practices around the world and then it will show you um, what they have on file for every culture in terms of their religious behaviors. It's really, really interesting. I'll link in the description um, or in the questions down below for you, depending on where you're watching this video. And then you can go and check that out. It's really, really interesting. Um, some of it is, is available without um, being a member institution or being a member. Others of it is not. So you can kind of get a feel for what it is um, just by going and checking out the website a little bit. It's very interesting um, and really shows that the comparative method is still relevant today. The next method we'll talk about is the genealogical method. Okay, this is specifically for kinship relations and how kin terms are used in different societies. So things um, like mother, father, brother, sister, cousin, um, those are obviously Western terms, but examples nonetheless. Okay, so English anthropologist Rivers, um, he first studied um, colorblindness, and so he started this method basically because he needed accurate data on relations between families and because he's tracking um, heredity, right? But the people in, um, the that he was studying, they had very unfamiliar kinship terms to him, and so he started classifying um, kin according to the relationships to his informants. And so we still use that system today. When we talk about kinship and family, we'll go into more detail about um, how we chart this and how we track kinship. But basically the genealogical method is just um, recording kinship relations and how kin terms are used in the society. Okay. Next we've got life histories and ethno history. These are looking at cultural change. So how um, culture changes either over time or um, by your age. Okay, so at different life stages or without written history. So life history um, are age-related aspects of social life. So as you move through life, um, you have different roles in society. When you're a baby, when you're a toddler, when you're a young adult, when you're an adult, when you're an elder. So your role is changing as your age changes. Okay, and so um, ethnographers and anthropologists will look at a society at any given point in time and study the different age groups in the culture through their life history. Okay, and so then you can see how age affects your typical or average social role um, by recording multiple life histories or um, people at different stages of their life within a society. Ethnohistory, um, this is how cultures are changing through time. Okay, so these are useful, this method is useful in non-literate communities where there isn't a recorded history to review, um, or in um, societies where you want to get a different perspective um, from what's actually written down. So ethno-historical research is used um, to get the people's understanding of the history of that community. Okay. And so that might be different from the official recorded history. So if you read an American textbook about the history of the United States, and then you talk to people, you're going to get two different stories very likely. Some of it will overlap, some of it won't. So ethnohistory can either allow you to um, understand the history of a community where there is no written record, or understand the on-the-ground history as opposed to the official history. Rapid appraisals, this is, um, like I said, we usually see anthropologists doing long-term field work, but rapid appraisal is kind of a new take or um, a different take. So this is short-term ethnographic field work, generally a few weeks as opposed to a year. Okay, and so this we don't tend to use if you don't have to. So it might be required for highly specific questions or when funding cannot be supported. 
but it's also for things like um, natural disasters. So you can't study the immediate effects of a natural disaster on a culture um, by staying for a super long time, right? Your, your research question is going to change. You're going to start to see long-term effects as opposed to immediate effects. So if you're wanting to study the immediate effects of a natural disaster, for example, you're going to want to engage in rapid appraisal or what is sometimes called parachute ethnography. Okay, this allows you to hone in your research time frame um, and keeps your focus around a specific event, for example. Okay, but you do have to have existing knowledge of the people in the society. You can't go in completely blind and expect to learn about the culture that way. You have to have some working understanding before you begin this kind of rapid appraisal. The next I'd like to talk about is action research. This is very similar to applied anthropology, um, except the purpose of it is to help make social change. Okay, because we talked about applied anthropology in terms of you can be an applied anthropologist working in the business field and creating better products, but that's not necessarily creating social change. Okay, so action research is research with the goal of the researcher's involvement is to help make societal change or social change. Okay, a branch of this um, is called participatory action research, and this is where um, questions, data collection, and analysis are defined and worked out through collaboration between the researcher and the subject of the research. Um, so this is where the anthropologist is working directly alongside the local community to come up with the research question and to decide how to study it and then actually studying it and then looking at the data collaboratively. Okay, And so a major goal of this is to kind of help the community develop the skills necessary to continue investigation and continue action on their own once the anthropologist has left the community. Another option we can talk about is anthropology from a distance. Okay, And this might be an issue if you want to study a community that is at war or um, something like that where you can actually access the community. Okay, So this is an option if you can't get to your community. Um, sometimes you might interview informants who are from the study community but have moved elsewhere. So um, classic examples, Ruth Benedict, she couldn't do her research, field research in Japan during World War II, so she interviewed Japanese people who had immigrated to the United States um, and published it that way. There might be some drawbacks to this, which I'll have you explore below in the questions here if you're working through the course. If you're working through this on YouTube on your own, um, then perhaps brainstorm how this might be um, detrimental to your research. If you're studying a community but the people are no longer living in that community, how might that differ? How might your answers differ um, if you're studying a displaced community as opposed to if you're studying in the actual community? All right, and then lastly, we want to talk about the use of secondary materials. Okay, first-hand fieldwork is very important to anthropology. It's very hard to get that insider perspective if you're not there in the community. But a lot can also be learned from secondary materials. So this is any information that comes from a secondary source, so information you aren't gathering yourself. So a census, a survey, historical reports, other research that has been done. Okay, so th this is all data that isn't compiled by yourself. Okay, it's always important to read secondary material very critically. So you need to understand the author's motivations, um, any bias, their theoretical perspective, things like that. So it's important that when you're using secondary materials, you're always considering what the other anthropologists or other scholars' bias or motivations might have been. But this can be very helpful to round out information, um, especially if you're using things that include historical data, like a census, when um, you can get a picture of what the society was like at that point in time. Okay, so secondary materials are an important um, tool that anthropologists use in addition to our field work. You don't want to rely solely on secondary materials.